that it keeps our inner selves alive, keeps us alert to experiences of physical survival on the part of those who engaged in the struggle and on our part as well. And so for me, in other words, um, we get new perspectives on the conflicts that are central to our own psychology, our own background, our own selves. We, we gain really important new perspectives on these issues that are of our own when we struggle with someone else's efforts to look deeply at those own issues in his own life. And that's the real reward of looking at uh, wild grass. Um, I became convinced because of reasons like this in my engagement with this text that a single uh, book was, was necessary because there was no book on Yetzal in English. There's lots and lots written in Chinese. And I'm deeply grateful to Cambria <laughs> for uh, agreeing with me that a, 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 a text on, on Yetzal is necessary because uh, quite a few other uh, very well-known academic presses that Victor Pry works with um, told me they were very interested and liked the manuscript, but that uh, uh, no one publishes uh, single author text anymore, and no one's interested in poetry interpretation anymore. Mm -hmm. um, really, I was told that quite a few times. Um, and each chapter of the book, I think, presents original perspectives on uh, the context and the content of the poems in Wild Grass. You'll find uh, extensive footnotes that uh, engage all of the extant uh, literature and help relate the Yetzal poems to other works of Lucian's that I think uh, have resonances and references. Um, I employ a, a psychoanalytically informed method um, that I describe as a, a kind of collaboration with the reader and the author in, in producing new knowledge. It's not just his or just mine. And I reevaluate quite a bit of the uh, greater historical context um, about this important period in Lushun's life. And um, I was, let's see, I should talk about uh, the research, future research. My close readings of the poems are not I, clearly the only way into these poems because poetry is uh, not given to sort of uh, monolithic interpretation. But I hope that I've sort of cleared the way with this first English language study for other scholars. Uh, they don't have to do all the footnoting and the documenting of the literary history and other things and can go right into the poems and uh, further the, the dialogue and understanding of uh, the importance of this particular work of art. And I'm still working on several of these poems in uh, essays I'm planning for the future. So I continue um, to write on this material and um, I, I don't think I'm done with it. Thank you. Finish by 8:30, or you can continue. Well, I'm just. Okay. And, and when are you going to? When are you going to have uh, Tansen speak after? After you. you. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next three books, uh, the authors are not here tonight, but so I'll move through them uh, much more quickly. And the first one of these, this set of three, is Anglophone Literatures in Asian Diaspora by Karen Anhui Li. The Literary trans Transnationalism and Translingual Migrations. So um, in this case, it says Anglophone, and I thought, well, Tony always asks me, do you, do you want this book in the series? And then I have to think, does it fit? And um, this says Anglophone, but it's Anglophone literature is in the Asian diaspora, so it's kind of like the obverse or mirror of Sinophone. And I thought it would be a good way to refract some of the Sinophone issues by having this uh, book in the series. Uh, Karen Lee is professor of English and department chair at Vanguard, Vanguard University. Her book has been reviewed by uh, International Journal of Comparative Literature and Translation Studies, uh, which stated, in the review, what Lee's monograph aims to do is ambitious, and it certainly succeeds at this goal. The use of concepts such as translation and migration in a way that follow, allows flexibility shows Lee's depth of knowledge in such areas and her confidence in applying it to literary criticism. Uh, the close textual analysis is also carefully developed, convincing 
and allows me to draw highly insightful and fascinating conclusions. Finally, she situates her work in a wider field and shows just how relevant literary scholarship can be to current scholarly debates, as well as to the contemporary world. So um, this is another book in the series that just, just coming out and very happy to have it. The next one after that is uh, Sinophone Malaysian Literature, Not Made in China. <laughs> this one. This book is by Alison Grope. Uh, assistant professor of Chinese literature in the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures at the University of Oregon. Mm. I want to say that uh, this is this was the easiest book to decide. One of the few, uh, one of the books that was easiest to decide to bring into this series because it's just like the heart, the core of what we mean when we say Sinophone literature. Um, writings in Chinese, uh, about Chinese, by Chinese, living outside of China. That's, especially in Southeast Asia, that's where the very concept of Sinophone began. So this is uh, very, very good to have this book in the series and it speaks for itself. Then the last book in this series that's coming out right now is uh, Modern Poetry in China, A Visual Verbal Dynamic by Paul Manfredi. Uh, Paul Manfredi is assist Associate Professor of Chinese and Chair of the Chinese Studies Program at Pacific Lutheran University. Uh, one thing about this book that's very special is that it has, of course, a lot of illustrations and there are some color illustrations in here too. Uh, because he's very interested in the interplay of visual and verbal in modern Chinese poetry. So I don't think there's any other book that um, handles this kind of subject so deftly. Um, I could say a lot more about all three of these books, but I want to turn the floor back. Uh, I'll turn the floor over now to uh, Tencent, who will talk about a, a book. Okay, it's also part of the series, but. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the editors, uh, and this is a volume called China and Beyond in the Medieval Period, uh, looking at uh, cultural crossing and interregional connections. Uh, the book originated uh, from a conference that was held uh, in Virginia, uh, looking at various ways in which Asia was connected. Uh, at that time, I was heading a center uh, in Singapore that was intending to promote the study of Asia by looking at intra-Asian connections. Uh, we thought the field of Asian studies, uh, as we are at the uh, Association of Asian Studies, does not study the entire Asia. Uh, the Middle East is somehow not part of Asia. Um, but we wanted to look at Asia uh, as, as a whole, as a region, uh, and by looking at how places were interconnected. So this volume uh, has 21 chapters uh, by famous scholars looking at various issues. Uh, it looks at networks that connected various regions of Asia. Uh, it has uh, a, a section that deals with uh, the silk routes, uh, both the maritime and the overland ones. Uh, it looks at the gender issues, how women were participant in intra-Asian connections. Uh, there's a chapter that deals with uh, Chinese diplomats, female diplomats going to the Central Asian Polities. Uh, there's a chapter that compares the mother of Lao Tzu uh, to Wu Zetian. Uh, Victor perhaps didn't know about this. Uh, it looks at uh, various kinds of technologies that were transferred from Middle East to China. Uh, so it has some very innovative ways of looking at Asia through the lens of connections that were established uh, that uh, leaves out various kinds of, of issues. Uh, and, and the reason why we were interested in this volume and we'll be very thankful for Cambria is that presses don't want to do conference volumes. Uh, it's very hard to publish uh, books that come out of conferences. Uh, uh, and and uh, in Singapore, we decided to use that. Uh, I'm very uh, happy that Tony wanted to have it uh, in the US as well. Uh, it's very nicely illustrated. 
Uh, it's about 400 pages. Uh, I think it will be a very important uh, contribution to the field of Asian history, uh, Asian art history, uh, and the study of the field of inter-Asian uh, connections. Uh, and I think it will be widely distributed, not only in, in the US, but also in Asia. Uh, that was the purpose of, of making Asian studies available both in the US and in Asia. Thank you. I'd just like to um, clarify one thing. It's not really conference proceedings. It's an edited volume in which there's a very strong unifying thread across the entire work. So, you know, it's not when I think, when you think of conference proceedings, you think of a hodgepodge collection of essays just thrown together. But in this case, uh, the editors, Dorothy and Gustav, have worked very hard to ensure that each, ch it reads like a book. It doesn't read like a collection of essays. And there, you, it is an amazing book. How many illustrations are there? 125. Yes. And in color, yeah, many of them. In in many color. of them in color. So yeah. this is yeah. this will be a very important book. Yeah. yeah. And and one more thing I just like to address is Nick Caldas's book, which is a, not only a single author, single is a single author book, but it was all you know. Many publishers came to me and said, "You're doing a single author, single work <laughs> book. Are you out of your mind?" <laughs> um, and initially, when I first looked at it, it was something that I. It, I'm sorry, I've been wearing these heels all day. It's impossible for me to stand. But it, it was very, very difficult for me to make this decision. But I did look, read his work, and there was one particular poem, and I think I spoke to you about it, Tremors of Degradation. Yeah, and, and Nick does talk about Lu Xun Zietel being very opaque. But Nick pulls the layers together. He um, really dissects it, and he makes Zietel very accessible to the reader. And his work is sort of like, um, Yechao is like one of those pictures with many dots in which there's an image. And everybody will tell you, oh yes, you know, you can see the dog wearing sunglasses, <laughs> eating an ice cream cone, I can't see anything. <laughs> but because of Nick, this Yechao, when most people can't see the context, the reason why this work is so important, Nick has actually painstakingly explained every single line. And in Tremors of Degradation, um, it's, a poem about, it starts off with, um, it, it focuses on a couple who are engaged in lovemaking, or so it seems, and then, you know, you, you're, you have the sense of being a guilty um, voyeur of, yeah. of, the, the, of, of the, the act. And then, he actually pulls it out to show that this woman is actually prostituting herself um, and her child is next to her. But I think when you look a little deeper into that, it, it, it highlights the economic conditions of China then, and the things that people were forced to do to survive. And so you go and you look at this poem, and you go from first being guilty, disgusted, angry, sad, and then sympathy empathy for this woman, you know, the things she has to do for survival, and even understanding. So it was that particular poem that said, yes, this is, this is excellent, you know, it was so painful, it pulled you through all the emotions, through a, a poem that was just so difficult to understand, to read, but Nick very eloquently pulled it together, and pulled it, and so now not the reason why we did this book, because I want to secure the floodgates before we get all these single author, single works, you know, um, before that nightmare begins. The reason why his book is so important is because reading his book will make you not only understand Yetel, but reading his book will make you understand all of other Yetel's books by looking at the most complicated work by Lu Xun. It's like looking at the most complicated picture, being able to grasp that image, and then all the other all the other pictures with all the dots, you'll be able to see it. So that's why, we, you know, there's an exemplary work, and that's why we decided you would do it. So please, no single author, single work proposals. <laughs> the floodgates must be secured. This was an exception. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, are there any questions for the authors? We were, you know, it's been a while, and are there any questions for any of the authors? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here.
Oh, 